Well, hello to all of you to, at all of our different campuses. A special shout out to those at North Aurora, at our Mill Creek campus, at our South Street campus. It's a brand new year. It's weird to think it's 2022, but it is. Uh, somebody reminded me that 2022 means 2020. Two, which is a terrifying thought. Nobody wants to relive 2020, but it's a new year and we serve the same faithful God. And we're, that means for us, we're digging into a new series over the next several weeks. The series is called Questioning God. Now, uh, several years ago, I got to know a man who was new-ish to our church and we had coffee and I said, I want you to tell me your story. Uh, you know, your, your upbringing, your background, how you came to know Jesus, where you are in your spiritual life. And he says, I'm very interested in spiritual things but I don't know that I can call myself a Christian at this stage of my life. I said, well, why not? He said, well, I just have too many questions to call myself a Christian. I need to get some of those questions resolved. And I told him that it be, having questions is not, doesn't mean you can't call yourself a Christian. It's, it's okay to have questions. We all have questions. But I thought often about that conversation because somewhere this man, and I think many, many people in our culture, had gotten the impression that to be a Christian, to be a true Christian, means you somehow have no more questions. They're all resolved. You're the person with the answers, not the questions. Is that true? Is that what we mean uh, when we talk about being a Christian, somebody who no longer questions or doubts or struggles or doesn't have anything that they wrestle with? Is that what a Christian is? I don't think so. Let's ask this question. Is it wrong to question God? That question is at the heart of our series, Questioning God. Is it wrong to question God? You might think, well, no, it's not wrong to ask questions about God. Well, that's true. You can ask questions about who God is, what God's like, what does his word mean, how can I trust it? Those are all really good questions to ask, and we should ask them. But that's not quite the same thing as questioning God, his existence, his character, his nature, his goodness, his love. Is it okay, is it okay to question those things about God? It feels, if we're honest, a little unsettling, a little bit like we're maybe that, you know, God is God. He's almighty God. He's the God, author of life. And who am I to question him? And sometimes in the church, we behave as if that's the way we have to think and act. But if we're honest, not all questions are the same. And not all those who ask questions ask from the same motives. There's a big difference between the honest, genuine, humble questioner who wants answers and the person who asks questions as a sort of intellectual trick to keep the truth at arm's length. And you know the difference. You've maybe lived the difference or experienced it in other people. Um, John Mark Comer, uh, in the introduction to a book called After Doubt, which is an excellent book by A.J. Swoboda, he writes this, Doubt is the ambient air we breathe in the West. Learning to walk through doubt and deconstruction about the, uh, and out the other side into reconstruction of an honest, humble, yet deep and robust faith that can flourish with both serenity and power in the chaotic and hostile world, that is no easy task. Now, there's a lot of talk today about those who are deconstructing their faith, walking away from it, tearing it down. But what comes after that is really the point. In A.J. Swoboda's book called After You Doubt, I recommend to you, if you or someone you know is wrestling with their faith, asking deep questions, maybe even what you might call deconstructing, it's a very helpful resource. Uh, he says, he asks the central question in this book, is it possible to question one's faith without losing one's faith? That's a key question. And that question also is at the heart of this series. I'm increasingly convinced that to question and to struggle with your faith is often the surest sign that you actually have a faith. To, did you hear that again? To question your faith is one of the surest signs that you have one. Sadly, the church, if we're honest, has not always done a very good job of giving people space, room, and language for asking those hard questions, for wrestling with their faith. It's to our shame that sometimes we have told people or somehow communicated to them even non-verbally by the environment, like this man that I was referring to, that somehow you can't have questions if you're going to be a good Christian. I think, honestly, actually the opposite is true. One of my spiritual heroes and literary uh, mentors, many of you will know, is C.S. Lewis. And Lewis was famous for many things, his writings and fiction and, and literature and poetry and literary criticism and medieval and Renaissance literature but also in popular apologetics, mere Christianity, miracles, and so on. But Lewis also wrestled with his own faith and questioned it in a book called A Grief Observed. 
If you or somebody you know is going through loss or pain in this season, uh, his book, A Grief Observed, is very helpful. And in the introduction to the most recent edition of A Grief Observed, here's what Madeline Langle writes about Lewis's uh, book, A Grief Observed. I am grateful, too, to Lewis for having the courage to yell, to doubt, to question, to kick at God with angry violence. This is a part of healthy faith, and not often encouraged. It is helpful indeed that C.S. Lewis, who has been such a successful apologist for Christianity, should have the courage to admit about doubt about what he has so superbly proclaimed. It gives us permission to admit our own doubts, our own anguishes and questions, and to know that they are part of the soul's growth. I, re- I, I echo Madeleine Langle's comments. Lewis is telling us that he, he's a hero, a giant of the faith, and yet he too wrestled with doubt and with questions. And it's not just the great thinkers and writers like Lewis that have wrestled with questions about God. The scriptures themselves are full of people who wrestle with questions about God, who express questions uh, not just about God, but to God, about who God is. Uh, there's no book of the Bible better for us than the Psalms when it comes to questioning God. The Psalms are the place where, in, in Scripture where we get language for our doubts and for our questions and for our struggles. The Psalms are raw and honest. They give us a vocabulary for things that we feel deep in our soul that we don't even know how to express sometimes. And they're meant to do so. That's why they were inspired, written down, captured, and passed down to us. The Psalms are not afraid of tough questions because God is not afraid of tough questions. Did you hear that? God is not afraid of or offended by your hard questions. In matter of fact, I believe that God invites them. It may be the very place he wants to meet you and to help you grow, if you let him. If we're like that second questioner, or or first one, open and, and honest and humble enough to receive the answer, even if sometimes we don't get it or don't like it. So our series, Questioning God, is going to look at five psalms and five questions about God. Psalm 39, what is the meaning or purpose of my life? Why am I even here? Psalm 42, why do I feel empty and unsatisfied? Psalm 27, why am I so afraid and anxious? And Psalm 24, who are you, God? Who is this king of glory? But this week, we begin in Psalm 10. Psalm 10 is a remarkable psalm. It's not attributed to David, but it's in the collection we, call, we believe was written by David. So David is the most likely author of Psalm 10. Psalm 10, uh, I believe, can serve as a bridge for us between the pain of our life and questions and the power of God if we let it. Let me read it to you in its entirety, and then we'll talk about it. Psalm 10. Why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? In arrogance, the wicked hotly pursue the poor. Let them be caught in the schemes that they have devised. For the wicked boasts of the desires of his soul, and the one greedy for gain curses and renounces the Lord. In the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. His ways prosper at all times. Your judgments are on high, out of his sight. As for all his foes, he puffs at them. He says in his heart, I shall not be moved. Throughout all generations, I shall not meet adversity. His mouth is filled with cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue are mischief and iniquity. He sits in ambush in the villages. In hiding places, he murders the innocent. His eyes stealthily watch for the helpless. He lurks in ambush like a lion in his thicket. He lurks that he may seize the poor. He seizes the poor when he draws him into his net. The helpless are crushed, sink down, and fall by his might. He says in his heart, God has forgotten. He has hidden his face. He will never see it. Arise, O Lord. O God, lift up your hand. Forget not the afflicted. Why does the wicked renounce God and say in his heart, you will not call to account? But you do see. For you note mischief and vexation that you may take it into your hands. To you the helpless commits himself. You have been the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and evildoer. Call his wickedness to account till you find none. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations perish from his, his hand, the land. O Lord, you hear the desire of the afflicted. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear to do justice to the fatherless and to the oppressed so that man who is of the earth may strike terror no more. That is, there's a lot in that psalm, and it's a powerful psalm. Could you hear the big question stated right at the beginning of the psalm? Did you catch it? 
Why do you stand far off? Why do you hide your face? In other words, where are you, God? Where are you? Why do you seem so distant? Why do you seem so far away? Why do you seem so uninvolved and unapproachable and uninterested in what's going on? Are you paying attention, God, to what's happening down here? Even that phrase, are you paying attention to what's going on down here, presumes that God is up there somewhere, far away from us. And some of us default to that when life is hard. But is that the message of Scripture, that God is far off and distant? We certainly feel like He is. Which of us hasn't felt this way at one time or another? Which of you haven't at some time in your life felt, where are you, God? Why do you hide? Why do you seem distant? But there's a specific reason the psalmist and, and David feels that God is distant and uninvolved. It's not just that God, in an abstract sense, seems far off. It's there's something happening that causes him to feel acutely God's distance or absence. It's the question behind the question. It's this question. Why do the wicked win and the innocent suffer? When I look at, the, at life and at the world, the wicked people are winning. Those who thumb their nose at you and scoff at you and live however they want, they're rich and successful and everybody follows them. And innocent, poor people, vulnerable people, suffer. And God, you're not doing anything about it. That's the heart of the question. Where are you, God, in the face of injustice is the real question David is asking. And again, which of us hasn't at one time or another, maybe right now, asking that question? God, there's so much injustice in the world. There's so much oppression. There's so many evil people doing awful things. Where are you? Why aren't you doing something about it? Now, of the 18 verses in the psalm, 11 of them deal with this, this person called the wicked. Now, let's be honest. That word itself may trip us up a little bit. It sounds like the, like the I, I can't help thinking of the wicked witch of the, of the East, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in, in the, the Dorothy in the Yellow Brick Road story of, uh, I, that's how my, where my mind goes. Maybe you think of like Wicked the Musical, or maybe you think Wicked like it's some sorcerer, but that's not what it's talking about. It's a specific Hebrew word with, with specific meanings. Uh, we, we, the wicked specifically that are causing injustice and oppressing people. So really what's at stake here is is what the theologians call a theodicy, or the problem of evil. If God is all-powerful and all-good, and yet this is going on, how do we reconcile that? Either he's not all-powerful because he can't do anything about it, or he's not all-good, he doesn't care about it. But how do we understand how God can be all-powerful and all-good and all-knowing and evil and injustice and wicked people in the world? It's not just the fact that evil and injustice exists. The real issue is God's apparent absence or distance in the face of it. Now, uh, C.S. Lewis, in the book I mentioned, A Grief Observed, he writes this in the second chapter. He says, it's not that I am in danger. And by the way, he wrote this book in the wake of the death of his wife to cancer, questioning God's goodness. He says, it's not that I'm in danger of ceasing to believe in God altogether. The real danger for me is that I might come to believe such dreadful things about God. He says, the conclusion I dread is not so there's no God after all, but, oh, so this is what God is like after all. Deceive yourself no longer. And I think that's true for many of us, especially those of us who have been in the church. We can't quite shake the feeling that there is, life is not an accident, there is a God, but what kind of God is he when we look out at the world? What kind of God is this when there's injustice and wicked people that are winning? Okay, so in order to make sense of this psalm, we have to do a little uh, profile of the wicked. Uh, the Hebrew word is rasha, and it means ungodly, or those, it means those who are opposed to God in their heart and in their actions, in their lives. It doesn't mean people who make mistakes or who sin. We all do. It means those people who live as if God doesn't exist or as if they don't care if he does. So let's do a little profile of the wicked. N number one characteristic, proud. Clearly, over and over again in the psalm, the wicked are proud. Let me read to you verses 2 through 4 and then verse 6. In arrogance, the wicked hotly pursue the poor. So we'll see the pride here showing up in a couple places. First of all, in arrogance, the wicked hotly pursue the poor. Let them be caught in the schemes that they have devised. For the wicked boasts of the desires of his soul. Now that's a fascinating phrase. Just for a minute, let me pause there. The wicked boasts of their own desires, meaning they're calling what they want good, 
purely because they want it. They're saying, I desire this, therefore it is a good thing I'm boasting of it because I want it. Well, that's happening all around us, those who call evil good and good evil, purely because they desire it. That's a symbol of the pride of the wicked. And the one greedy for gain curses and renounces the Lord. In the pride of his face, that's an interesting phrase as well, the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him. Pride of his face might sound, what does that mean? Do they look proud, like they have a look of, a, of pride on their face? Maybe like the English expression, turning up your nose at someone. When it comes to God and God's law and God's will, they kind of, you know, the pride of their face. That's ridiculous. That's, that's the image we're being given there. The wicked does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. He says in his heart, I shall not be moved. So his thoughts and in his heart, those two things are going together there. Throughout all generations, I shall not meet adversity. Okay, that's a profile of the pride of the wicked. First Peter 5, uh, 5 tells us, we are to clothe ourselves, all of us, with humility because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Pride is the fundamental disposition of the person opposed to God. And it is the root of the original sin. I want to call the shots for myself. I want to be God, and I don't want a God who I'm accountable to. Second, corrupt talk. Corrupt talk. We see over and over again references to their speech and their language and their, the corruption of what they say. Look at verses 3 and verses 7. For the wicked, again, boasts of the desires of his soul. <clears throat> he curses and renounces the Lord. His mouth is filled with cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue are mischief and iniquity. So, in other words, you know this person by the way they talk. You know the kind of language they use. Curses, renouncing God, deceit, iniquity. Jesus tells us that in Luke chapter 6 that out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Have you ever been around a person where um, just being around them, the content of the conversation and the tone of the conversation makes you somewhere inside feel just darkened, like your mind is darkened, like it's just, a, it's oppressive, it's, it's not encouraging, it's not uplifting, it's not life-giving at all. That's the image here. Not that they're always saying curse words, although they may be, but that their speech, the content and the character of their very speech betrays what's going on in their heart. Third, they're greedy. Greed is a characteristic of the wicked. Uh, verses 3 and verses 9. For the wicked boasts of the desires of his soul, the one greedy for gain curses and renounces the Lord. He lurks in ambush like a lion in a thicket. That's, that's interesting, lurking in ambush like a lion in his thicket. What is that talking about? Well, you might be thinking, well, I, you know, I, I'm not planning an ambush. I'm not lurking in some, behind someone's bushes to uh, jump out at them, so I must be good on this one. It's not really saying that. It's talking about those um, who not only... Um, who oppress people, they do it intentionally. They do it willfully, thoughtfully. They're seeking out how, it's, so, it's the person who cares only about their own gain, greed, even at the expense of others, knowing it's costing and hurting other people. That's the mark of the wicked. Fourth, violent. There's violence is a characteristic of the wicked. Let me look at verses eight and 10 for just a moment. He sits in ambush in the villages and hiding places. He murders the innocent literally causing violence, but also doing those things which would cause innocent people to perish because they lack by his own greed. His eyes stealthily watch for the helpless. He lurks in ambush like a lion in his thicket. He lurks that he may seize the poor. He ceases the poor when he draws them into his net. The helpless are crushed and sink down and fall by his might. There's a, there's a wake of wrecked lives behind the wicked person those who've been exploited and oppressed and abused and mistreated and talked down to and harmed both spiritually, emotionally, physically. They're abusive. There's violence. Not always physical violence, but harm, causing harm to people intentionally. And fifth, and this is the primary characteristic which kind of pervades the whole description here, they're godless. It's the underlying characteristic in this whole section of the wicked. Now, this, by the way, it's important we get this straight. They're, it's not the same thing as questioning the existence of God. It's not the same thing as an honest person who's wrestling with, is God really here? Does God really care? They are 
willfully, intentionally rejecting God. They're godless in that sense. It's the attitude of the heart that says, I'm accountable to no one but myself. There is no God, or I don't care if there is, because I'm calling the shots. Let's look at verses uh, 4 and verse through 11. In the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him. All his thoughts are, all his thoughts are, there is no God. So that doesn't mean he's walking around every day thinking there's no God, there's no God, there's no God. It means what's going on in his mind, he's living as if, he's thinking as if, I'm, there's no God. I'm a functional atheist. You know, I know some people who go to church who call themselves Christians who are functional atheists, who live as if there is no God, who is, doesn't see the way that they live and behave and speak and act. Let's read on. His ways prosper at all times. That's the part that's so offensive to David. Your judgments are on high, out of his sight. It means he's not even thinking about or caring about God's word or will. For all his foes, he puffs at them. He says in his heart, I shall not be moved. Throughout all generations, I shall not meet adversity. His mouth is filled with cursing and deceit and oppression under his tongue. We've already read that. Under mischief and iniquity, he sits in ambush in the villages. Skipping down here, it says, the helpless are crushed, they sink down. And the last verse 11, he says in his heart, God has forgotten. He has hidden his face. He will never see it. Now, in verse 4, he says there is no God. In verse 11, he says, God has forgotten. Does that strike you as interesting? There's no God. God doesn't see. Well, how can you say God doesn't see if there's no God to see in the first place? And actually, I think this is very profound. What's going on here is that Derek Kidner, in his commentary on the Psalms, a brilliant commentary, he says, this is the inner dialogue of the ungodly person. They can never quite shake the reality and the thought in the back of their mind that there is a God. Some of us ask the question, well, is, is there really a God? But the question we ought to be asking is, what if there really is a God? It's a difference, isn't it? Is there really a God? Nah, I, I can do what I want. Or what if there really is a God? And he really did create me. And he really does have rightful claim over my life. And I really am accountable to him. They cannot quite convince themselves that God does not exist. So there is no God, there's no God, there's no God, but even if there is, he doesn't see or care. Why? To give myself a pass on how I want to live. Okay, all of this leads David to a kind of crisis of faith. He sees and he personally experiences the oppression, the injustice of wicked people in the world. This is not an abstract question. It's pers deeply personal to him. And he can't reconcile it with a God that he knows from the Word, from the Old Testament, from his own life. How do these match up? I don't, I don't, and if that happens to you, if you come up in life experience with questions and experiences that you cannot reconcile with your understanding of God, either your understanding of God is too small, right? The, either the, 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 the God you know is just false and wrong, or your understanding yet isn't big enough to put those two things together. And that's the story of Psalm 10. It's leading us to a greater understanding of who God is. David uh, isn't going to stay in the question of, of verse 1. Where are you, God? Why do you hide your face when the wicked win? But it's, so he doesn't stay there. He's going to move on and help us move on. But it's important to know that he starts there. Because I know that some of you are there right now. And I want you to hear that right there in the Psalms, King David himself is asking that question. And it's not sinful to ask that question. God is not offended or, or uh, dismissing you because you wonder where he is or if he is. He's big enough to handle that, as he was with David. So he is with us. And also, I want you to see that God is at work even in David's questioning. This is inspired scripture, Psalm 10. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, David wrote Psalm 10 even including the parts where he questioned where God is. Which means God is at work even when David feels like he's far away. And that means, friends, God is at work in you even when you feel like he's far away or you wonder if he's there at all. Your feeling in the moment of God's presence and activity is not the best measurement of his presence and activity. It's good to remember that. Okay, so let's ask this question. How, what do we do? How should we pray? 
How should we pray then if this is what we face? Now, first of all, this presumes that you will pray and that you keep praying even in the face of your questions. I, I remember years ago as a, as a high school pastor, we had these uh, in-home Bible studies with uh, students and I was at, we would go around and have prayer time. And I remember this one young lady who was a, a student leader and she, said that she told me she didn't want to pray at the end of the group. And I asked her why. And she said to me, one of her uh, uh, female leaders, she said, well, I don't think I'm worthy to pray. I'm, I'm too angry at God. She'd had uh, some loss in her life. Her parents went through a painful divorce and some, some pain and lost a friend. Uh, and she felt, she was just angry at God. And she thought, she said, I got to work out my anger before I really should be praying. <laughs> uh, actually, prayer is how you work out your anger. Now, I understand her desire not to pray publicly, and that's okay. But prayer is the way that God helps us work out our anger. The Psalms are full of expressions of anger and pain and difficulty. So David cries out to God. And then in verses 12 and 13, he says, Arise, O Lord. Lift up your hand, O Lord. He's He's, it's like he's turning a corner here from this, this profile of the wicked and how awful they are and, and how they get away with it, or at least it seems like they do, to calling on God to do something. Why does the wicked renounce you? Why does he say you will not call to account? Why do you let him get away with it, in other words, God? The turn comes then in verse 14. We'll get to that in a minute. But in the final five verses, we're given some very practical helps on, on how to pray. Let me just walk through three of them. First, stop thinking like the wicked. <laughs> now that sounds rather simple. So just stop it. Just stop thinking like the wicked. Uh, look at verse 10, uh, uh, verse 1 and verse 11. O Lord, why do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? That's David's prayer. This is the, what the wicked says. The he, the wicked, says in his heart, God has forgotten. He has hidden his face. He will never see it. Hidden his face hide yourself. You see what's happening here? David is asking a question that is actually the very expression of the heart of a wicked person. In other words, David has, in, this, in these 11 verses of the profile of the wicked, sort of slipped into this thinking, like the very same vein of thinking that the wicked have, which is there is no God. He doesn't see. He doesn't care, which is what David's questioning. Prayer does this, though. It, it helps us, it, it reveals the, the reality of our own hearts and minds. It helps us get clarity about where we may be misguided and off. And God allows us and invites us to wrestle with him in prayer. Do you know that the people of Israel, you know where they got their name? Some of you Bible scholars will know this, but Israel, the name means wrestles or struggles with God. And it, it was the name that was, Jacob had his name changed to Israel. And of course, the 12 tribes of Israel come out of the line of Jacob. So the very name of God's people in the Old Testament are those who wrestle and contend with God. And that's still true today. God invites his people and allows his people to wrestle, to struggle. He's not afraid of that. He's not trying to crush you. He invites you into that struggle because it's the very place he wants to lead you to a deeper understanding. So in this psalm itself, we're given this sort of progression of David asking the question that betrays the very heart of the wicked and realizing, wait a second, wait a second, I'm not seeing it right. And we get that in the second thing, start trusting God. Now that sounds simple and easy to do, right? Just trust God. I know that it's not. Believe me, I know that that's not easy to do. Start actively placing your trust in God even when you don't have the answers or don't understand them. How? Let's look at verse 14. This is the turn of the whole psalm, the turn of David's heart. But you do see. Circle that, highlight that, underline that in your Bibles, write that down in your journals. Right? What's the question been? God, do you see? God, do you care? God, you don't see? Are you hidden? Are you hiding your face? And then David turns a corner in his own heart and says, oh, you do see. But you do see. For you note mischief and vexation, that you may take it into your hands. To you the helpless commits himself. You have been the helper of the fatherless. David now is reminding himself, you have been, of who God has been. He, he wonders if God currently is doing this, but he looks back and says, oh, I know what you've been in my life and in history. I see what you've been. David is saying to himself and to God in prayer, I may not see how this is going to work out. I may not understand in this moment or see what you're doing. I may not see your hand working its, its, its sovereign plan. I may not see how your justice is being played out, but you see. 
Just because I don't see doesn't mean God doesn't see. And right now, you may not see where God is. You may not see what God is up to. You may not think anyone sees what you're dealing with. But God does see. Friends, I hope if you hear nothing else, you hear that. God does see. That's what David is saying to himself and to us. He's, he's preaching to himself. Do you ever do that? Preach to yourself in the moments when you're questioning, when you have existential doubt, when you're wondering where God is. Speaking truth to yourself and to each other in these moments. I know it feels like God is absent, but he's with you. We just celebrated Emmanuel, God with us. That's not just true once a year on December 25th. It's true right now today. Notice also in, in the text that David, he draws strength from attributes of God. He talks about God's eye in verse 14, you do see. He talks about God's ear in verse 17, you hear the cry of the afflicted. And in verse 12, he says, stretch out your hand, break the arm of the evildoer, the wicked. That doesn't mean literally like so we can notice them by their broken arms. It means stop their power, eliminate their ability to cause harm. And then in, in verse 16, you're king forever, God's reign. So God's eye, God's ear, God's hand, and God's reign. That's how we trust God. You see, you hear, you're, you're able, and you're on the throne, despite how I feel or despite how it looks in this moment. And third, finally, stay close to Jesus. Stay close to Jesus. You might be thinking, well, well where is Jesus in this psalm? <laughs> it's an Old Testament psalm. I didn't hear Jesus in there anywhere. Actually, he's all over Psalm 10. Let me ask you a couple questions. Did Jesus ever know what it was like to feel that the wicked were winning in the world? Did Jesus ever wonder where, question the absence of the Father? Did, did Jesus ever ask the question, where are you, God? Did Jesus know the struggle and surrender uh, to, of his own will to the will of the Father? Did Jesus ever face opposition from those who opposed God and himself? In Luke 22, verse 53, he's, Jesus says, you, I was with you every day in the temple courts, but now you come to me with clubs. This is your hour when darkness reigns, speaking of wicked people. In Matthew 27, verse 46, when he's on the cross, he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Quoting Psalm 22. If that's not a cry of where are you, God, what is? In Luke 23, 46 Father, into my, your hands I commend my spirit. Friends, Jesus knows every, every, every movement of the soul that gave birth to this psalm. He knows every feeling and emotion that's behind it. And Jesus is able to pray this psalm with you. Not just for you, but with you. Right now, in the midst of your struggles and questions, he can and he will meet you. I don't think it's wrong to deconstruct our faith. I think we should be always deconstructing our faith, asking hard questions about it, pulling down things that maybe we built up that aren't part of Scripture or aren't part of who God is, but for the sole purpose of having God rebuild it on the foundation of Christ, the chief cornerstone, the New Testament tells us. So not deconstruction, which becomes destruction and deconversion, but deconstruction so that God might rebuild us on a firm foundation that's what's happening in Psalm 10. That's what we invite you into in this series, to ask the hard questions in community groups, in your own heart, in your prayer time, in the Word of God. Let's do that together, and let's trust Jesus as he leads us into a deeper faith in who he really is. Friends, he could handle it. He's big enough to handle your questions. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this ancient psalm, this prayer of David, which has come down to us, and we find in it questions that are so timely and relevant for us. We, too, wrestle with wondering where you are, God. We, too, question if, you're, if, you're, if you care and if you're present, if you're paying attention. And we, too, look at the world and see injustice, and it grieves us, and we wonder if it grieves you. But, God, in that moment, turn our hearts to trust you, to stop thinking like the wicked, to place our trust in you despite the fact that we don't have all the answers, to believe in our hearts that you see. You see us and you hear us even in our questioning and that we might walk with you, Jesus, through our doubt and questions into a deeper faith and trust. We pray this in your name. Amen.